We wish to advise that matters raised in the following program may disturb some viewers. A disturbing fact of life of living in Australia is the threat of sexual violence. A recent international crime survey found that the rate for offensive sexual behaviour is highest in Australia, higher than the countries of Europe, higher than Canada, and a rate that exceeds America. Do you wish to make a further statement in relation to the matter? Mm. Interview concluded at 6.15am, Saturday the 4th of May 1991. It's estimated that 90% of all rapes committed in this country are never reported. And yet the violence of sexual assault will touch the life of one Australian woman in four. I'm an, an ordinary mother living in a house in the country. And yet this person came from somewhere else, violated my house, violated my person. I have one image that I continuously have a nightmare about and don't go without a week without still having it and it's of faces, faces with <laughs> black hair bushing out right up to my face and screams and and groping and and loud music and crowds a naked uh, just a naked male would make me go cold even my baby um i'd just go cold at the sight of male nakedness penis even now it's just sometimes I'm OK with the kids, but to see Martin naked even now, just sometimes it turns me, um, takes me back. If my life had ended, I hadn't achieved in my life what I wanted to achieve. I wanted to grow old. I wanted to have a family. I wanted to enjoy my life, to do lots of things. And I felt like I had done nothing. It was the start of my life, and he was taking that away from me. rape incident happened and uh, this utility I was in was a stolen car. I uh, saw a house, a farmhouse light on, so I drove up a farmhouse driveway. I was looking for money and petrol. a very hot day. The house was fairly open 
to let some cool air in. Would have been about 20 past 11 at night. All of a sudden, the dog went berserk. And I looked up and there was a person outlined at the door. And I said, can I help you? Um, and this young man said, oh, I've run out of petrol at the top of your driveway. Have you got any petrol that I could have? Oh, I knew I had about five litres out in the garage, but I wasn't very happy about going outside with some strange man at, you know, almost midnight. And I went and got the dog's lead, turned the light on in the shed and the floodlight on the side. And I went and got the petrol and I started walking down towards the front of the house saying, you know, hello, are you there, hello? And there was no answer and, you know, I mean, it must have been a few minutes to do all this. And I was still calling and I heard his footsteps coming down the path. And he, uh, he said, oh, right. And he said, oh, um, Jesus is a big place. And I said, Jude, it's pretty big. And he said, it must be, must be hard to run a big place like this for yourself. And just alarm bells went off. I thought, no, there's something wrong here. This is odd. Um, even though first impression, he looked so young, you know, very harmless, young, you know, like a, like a, a young brother or something. Um, but these alarm bells went off in my mind. I thought, this is, this is not right. Um, so I just kept the dog really close. Um, and I said, look, here's the petrol. I said, where's your car? And he said, oh, it's just down the drive. And when he'd said he'd run out of petrol on the drive, I thought he meant down near the road. And I looked on the back part of the circle drive. You could just see this car very faintly. It was positioned behind the trees. It seemed like he was... Um, just feeling around to see exactly how vulnerable I was, um, exactly how far the nearest help was, and sizing up a situation. Now, what that situation was, I didn't know. Um, but Tam was getting very upset by this stage. Every time he moved, he growled, he'd lunge at him, and I thought, well, you know, whether he's nice or whether he's not, any minute now he's going to get really badly bitten. Um, so I said, look, I'm going inside now. I said, the dog's going to take a piece out of you in a minute. And I turned and I was starting to get annoyed. And I watched those lights go down the driveway and I watched them go around every bend. And the last thing I saw was him turning right towards Melbourne. Later on, I found out that she had a knife in her pocket because uh, she was wary of me from the start anyway. And you weren't aggressive towards her? No, no. If the dog hadn't have been there, I might have got aggressive and tried to rob her. And do you think that you may have uh, raped her as well? Could that have happened? It could have, but then again, I don't know. down and I dumped it and I walked up the road about 200 metres where I stole a sedan and uh, I then drove on to Broadford. I'd been up all night and I needed some money because I was running out of petrol. It was a very hot Thursday morning. And my son had gone to work at about 6.30. I had to go to Melbourne for a doctor's appointment, so I decided to wash the kitchen floor first. 
And after I'd done that, I sat and had a cup of coffee. And I heard a knocking on the door. And it was a young man wearing a cap and sunglasses and looking like a normal young man. I, I thought him to be about 18 or 19. And I opened the door and said, yes, can I help you? And he said, I'm, I'm looking for Mick Cook. Does he live here? And I said, no, no, he doesn't. Um, you could try around in the lane. There's a young man that lives there. Perhaps that's him. And he said, where was that? And I said, around the corner in the lane. And he said, thank you very much. And I closed the door and locked the door and he went. Stop the car. They had look in the boot. And there was a knife and a cricket stump. And I heard it a toot of the car in the driveway. And I came out again, and the same young man was standing with the driver's door of his car open, standing behind it. And he said, could you give me those directions again? And I told him. And then he said, could you draw me a map? And at that instant, I knew there was something wrong. And I said, give me your money, bitch. He said, I want your money, bitch, and held up a a very large knife and a cricket stump. So I ran around to the door and she'd shut it and gone out the back door. And in middle of her running to the back door, I smashed the front window. I took off through the kitchen and I heard the glass of the family room door shatter behind me. I went out through the back kitchen door and ran down towards the garage. And he went down the front of the house and beat me round the corner, holding the knife and the cricket stump and, and had me by the arm. And, and at that stage, um, I knew there wasn't any point fighting. He had the knife, he had the power. And he said, get inside, I want your money. So she went back into the house and I said, where's your money? She showed me a handbag and she said, there's some money in there, you know, take it. So I opened up a purse, it was about $40 in cash in there. And uh, I saw a, a visa card. I said, what's your number? And she wouldn't tell me at first and sort of put the knife up to her, up to her throat and said, look, if you don't tell me, I'll kill you. And. I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe it was happening. I just couldn't believe. I never could have imagined something like that happening to me in my own house. I've always felt very safe in this house. It's the country, you know, you're safe in the country. Things like that don't happen. People don't necessarily lock doors in the country. And the locked door made no difference anyway. And so there I was with this, this, this young man and he'd taken off the sunglasses and I could see him and I was very, very afraid of him then. And uh, I sort of went for a look through the house. You know, had a sort of the knife behind the back and walking through the house to see what was in the house. Anything I could steal or anything I wanted. And then I went around cutting all the phone lines so that she couldn't call the police as soon as I left. And uh, this time it sort of felt it felt good because they had control of things. You know, whatever I said, she was she was doing it, you know. And uh, it was a big adrenaline rush. Was, you know, it was a, to me it was a good buzz. It was a real good buzz. It's like a new drug. And then he said, get your clothes off. And through my brain went, don't be ridiculous. I'm 46 years old, you know. Why would you want me to get my clothes off? She only had a dressing gown on. And I sort of, you know, caught a, a glimpse of her breasts and that. And then, uh, for the adrenaline, I sort of got sexually excited. And I told her to take her dressing gown off, so she took it off. And um, I 
told to get into the bedroom. She's told me, you know, she said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to rape you. You ever seen this knife before? Well, I'll put it to you that, that this is the knife that was uh, used by the male person when threatening the, th threatening the lady occupier of the house. Any comment on that? No. All right. Now, as a result of that, the uh, male person attacked the woman, took her into the bedroom and raped her. Any comment on that? Definitely not. Well, I'll put it to you that you were the person involved. Definitely not. And he raped me with the knife right next to my neck on the pillow. And and he said, I bet, I bet I'm the youngest you've ever had. He told me he was 16. And how did I like it? How did I like it? What do you say? What do you say when someone says that? I didn't say anything. And he said, do you ever scree, son? That was, that was actually one of the most horrible things about it. She'd had an operation on her breast or something. She had four stitches and she just told me to take it easy, more or less. And she wasn't really gonna argue. In her own little way, she was arguing and saying no, you know what I mean, but, um, to me, there wasn't much she could do because I was such so demanding and stuff like that. And uh, that's when it occurred. You know, we had uh, sexual intercourse. I raped her. Just uh, one final question before we pause for a break. Um, you also have a look at this tracksuit pants. Can you tell me who they belong to? No. Mm. You haven't seen them before? No. Mm. Well, they're in this bag that you've identified as belonging to you. Yeah, they're not mine. See, they've been described by the woman who was raped as being uh, very similar to the uh, tracksuit pants were worn by the offender that raped her. Any comment to make on that? He stayed dressed. He stayed dressed for the entire thing. He just pulled down the tracksuit pants. That was it. By that stage, he was very jittery, and I was getting very nervous of him, because until then he'd been so cold and so, so nothing, such nothing behind the eyes. And I was afraid of him just seeing me as an object to be got out of the way, because I'd seen him. After we'd finished, I uh, told her to put her dressing gown back on and asked if there was any rope in the house. When he said, have you got any rope, I was so relieved because I thought he's decided not to kill me. walking straight home, I said to Mum, don't worry about picking me up because it was a nice day. And I decided to, instead of walking on the main road, I'd walk on sort of a dirt track, which is just beside it, which there's a few, there's big cypress trees on each side. You know, everyone walks down there. There's horses, people walking their dogs, joggers, everyone just used that track. I saw this man I noticed that he stopped behind a tree and was sort of looking at. I didn't know what he wanted, but I knew that something was going to happen, so I sort of just turned and started to run. He grabbed the back of my top and... and the thing that just came into my head was, nah, this is a dream, you know, it's not happening to me, no way. And I just started, I screamed, and, I mean, there was cars going past. I sort of went along my way and he kept on following me and I would ask, you know, do you know where you are, do you, where are you going? 
And he said, you just say, I'm just roving. And I tried to express that I wanted to be on my own. And he would just say, I'm just roving. And by this point, those words were becoming really haunting. on the train he hopped on the train and sat beside me and and then when I hopped out of the train at Sydenham he topped off and at that point I really panicked because I thought yeah he really is following me you know now I'm getting near home territory and you have to admit rave is a fear for ev every woman and you, you you think about it and you come up with strategies you think well, what will I do in this situation um, it was up here that I crossed the road and started going up this street and it was around here that um, he grabbed me and, I mean, yeah, I was really close to home and it was at this entrance to the park and it was at the fence that I grabbed onto and tried to reason with him. I immediately thought, OK, I want to talk, talk it out with this person and I said, why are you doing this? What do you want? And he didn't reply. He just ripped my hand, my grip off the fence and just dragged me over to a park bench and was saying, yeah, get over there. And I just kept screaming. And so then he grabbed the back of my hair and dragged me to the dam, which was oh, probably a few metres away, and threatened that if I didn't do what he wanted, he just drowned me. He, he pushed my head closer to the water and that's when I shut up. I thought, you know, if I keep screaming, he's just going to... He will drown me. I, I felt like... I was still thinking like I could talk my way through this. Perhaps um, make some sort of deal so that I... to ease the, the, the pain, the long-term pain on me. Um, and so I was, you know, he said that he wanted to finger me. And so I said, you know, is that all you want to do to try and get him to to really be bound to that's all he was wanting to do? And he said, yeah, I only want to finger you. And I said, you promise? He said, I only want to finger you. So in some way there was some sort of ease put in my mind. I thought, well, I can cope with that. And then perhaps I can go my way, but I guess Deep down, I didn't really believe that that would be what would happen. You know, he, he, he tried to pull my pants down and I kept punching him. And as I was doing that, I sort of pulled them back up and he was getting really angry with me, you know. He didn't think, again, he didn't think I was going to be that strong and that I'd probably just let him do it and, you know, go away. At one point, his weight was sort of eased off me a bit and I thought, OK, I'll try and escape and you know, leapt up, but um, I mean, for, for one, you know, I had my, my stockings were pulled down, you know, how, how can you run, you know, like you're, my ankles are bound, and secondly, you know, he immediately grabbed me and, and pulled me down, and so I just felt completely hopeless. He went to take my jumper off, and I sort of um, put it over my head, and he just you know, then it was sort of off and he didn't have a grip on me at all. And then so I just slipped it off my arms and ran and he ran the other way. I just ran home. I thought, <laughs> never run so fast. A few minutes later, I was in a similar situation and I thought I'd try again. Um, so I thought through how I could quickly get that first leap off. Um, but the second time, he grabbed me much firmer and just dragged me right to the corner of the park and rammed my head in the corner and sat on my chest with his knees like pinning down my shoulders and clenched his fist and shook it in my face saying, if you ever do that again, and put his penis in my, my mouth and just pushed it further and further down my throat and 
just, you know, chanted, swallow it, swallow it. So I just felt, it's the most trapped I've ever felt. You know, like, I couldn't move any part of my body and, you know, I didn't have a voice. There's nothing I, no way I could express. I, I was just nothing, I guess I was just, just a hole, you know, I just, and yeah, I just thought, this is it, this is it. Am I gonna get out of this? We can't tell you what to do. You can either, if you're in a situation, you can either be passive, talk your way out of it, or fight. You have to decide, you're the best judge. Your survival instincts are very, very important. And may, what may work in one situation may not work in another. The important thing is if you survive, then you've done the right thing. My husband had gone off to do a bit of work to earn some extra money. I thought he was coming home about 11 and then uh, realised it was rubbish bin night. And I better get that out and uh, took it out the front. Looked around the street, which I often did. I walked in through the back gate and shut it. I was just about to walk in the back door and I heard the gate open. I thought, oh, he's home. I don't know why I think thought that now, because I didn't hear the car. But I assumed it was him. And I saw two figures standing inside the gate. And I, my first thought was that they'd been friends, that they were friends that were passing and dropped in. And I, thought, I said, hi, and no one answered. And I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> something's wrong here. I was approached at the bus stop by a young chap he asked me if I could loan him some money because he lost his wallet and I gave him the money and then I went on my bus and went home and later that night and there was a knock at the door and he was this same young fellow. I just looked at him and said, my God, fancy being so honest to come back and pay this money. And so I flicked the switch of the security door. I only had it partly open about that far when he pushed it open the rest of the way and just pushed at me with a fair bit of force that I reeled back over the settee that was by the front door. There was a, a fairly big guy and a small average type guy and the small one grabbed me by the arm, by the wrist and um, turned me round and as he did that, um, the other one walked behind me and put his hand over my mouth and said, don't scream, which of course was all I wanted to do. And I bit his hand and uh, got a scream out and was promptly punched for my effort. And um, I must have fallen because the next thing I can remember is being dragged along the ground um, by uh, my hair and my left arm, which is most frustrating because I'm left-handed. You know, I still think that if it hadn't been my left hand, it would I would have been able to have a bit of a fight. And then he came over and hit me on the breast and then just grabbed hold of my wrists with this fist like that and just turned me onto the, onto the ground. And at one point I lifted my head, and he had sneakers on, and he just pushed my head down with his foot. Anyway, they dragged me up the back of the garden, and uh, uh, the smaller one um, got in front, was still in front of me, and the other one by this time was behind me. And